now I get recorded. You know what it is? I've been, I was signing in with my personal Zoom account, which is the free version, not the one through the college that is paid for by the chancellor's office, which allows the recording to the cloud. That's what the issue's been. All right, now that we figured that out, I feel very accomplished for the day. But yeah, exactly. How wonderful by eight o'clock. Um, and just in case anybody was interested, my work. We did our New Year New Year's cards, our Christmas cards out. You can't see those are pictures of my beautiful kids. <laughs> The auto zoom is now autofocus is not working. If you're interested, you can come see a picture at break. That's why I don't use the document scanner. All right. So we started with making epoxides the other day. Um, these are some of the example problems that I said we'd we'd come back to. So these are what happens if you've got a an ether and you expose it to excess acid and heat. Um, remember, you, we wind up protonating the ether, which makes it what? What's uh, if you protonate an ether, what's it going to do next? What is it at that point? It's an oxygen with three bonds, which is also a good leaving group. So when you protonate an oxygen, when you give an oxygen a positive charge, everything has a full valence, which is all well and good. And it also makes that oxygen a good leaving group. All right, so anybody recall what the net product is? If you take an ether and you expose it to excess strong acid? Yeah, we wind up replacing both of the carbon oxygen bonds with carbon halogen bonds, assuming we're using a strong, um, strong uh, halide. Hydrohalic acid, what's the, I think it's something close to that. Binary acid is a better choice for it, strong binary acid. So our intermediate for D, would look like after step one, we protonate that oxygen, gives it a positive charge, makes it a good leaving group. And then the iodine can come in Oop, wrong, wrong carbon. Remember, we can't have a nucleophilic attack on a benzene carbon. So the, if we have one of one of the two carbons attached to the ether is a benzene carbon, it has to attack the other carbon. And we just have a quick SN2 reaction and we wind up with a product of Uh, three iodopropyl two or two. We were naming this compound. We didn't dealt too much with using halogens in uh, in parentheses, but they work the same way as adding another branch in parentheses. So if we were trying to name this, the base molecule would be the phenol that has a propyl group attached, and on the propyl group there's an iodine. So we would say it's phenol and on carbon two of phenol of the phenol, we have three iodo propyl group.
So anytime you can recognize a common name of a molecule and you want to use that as your base, you can always adjust it by adding a prefix. Sometimes if your if your branch that you're adjusting is its own functional group or has a functional group on it, you have to get you have to use the different prefixes. Um, and so in this, sometimes that means that there can be uh, more than one name for something. Um, if there's if it's made up of two common molecules that are linked together, for instance, because we could also name this as something like, you know, um, a hydroxyphenyl group attached to iodopropane, because the prefix for an alcohol is hydroxy, so you could use that to modify a phenyl group as well. This is probably the better choice um, because the phenyl group has more carbons in it, or the benzene ring has more carbons in it. All right. So, with that in mind, what do we get from E? Actually, let's let's do F first, so that we and then we'll worry about the um, stereochemistry on E last. We end up replacing the oxygen on the ox carbon oxygen bond with the carbon bromine bond on the cyclohexyl side. You replace the carbon oxygen bond with the carbon bromine bond on the ethyl side. Make a byproduct of water. In these reactions too, we, we typically use um, heat to try and drive these reactions towards the product side, but you can also use um, a desiccant, something that that preferentially res, um, removes water from the system, because if you can remove water from the system, then that allows us to um, use Le Chatelier's principle and, and push everything towards the product side as well. Um, most most desiccants aren't going to work all that well with X with these um, binary acids because there's a lot of water left over in those, even if you're using the concentrated form. Um, but you could also conceivably do that, you know, do something like this in um, a less polar solvent or so a solvent that forms two layers and the water will form its own separate layer, which effectively removes it from the reaction. Um, you would have to play around with exactly what solvent would work given what molecules you are working with because it's also going to slow the reaction down because remember we have a charged intermediate. Right, our protonated intermediate needs to be stable as well, or else you can't have the reaction happen. So it's something where, from a practical standpoint, we would want to play around with this in lab to get an idea of what conditions work best for us for our exact molecules we're working with. How is stereochemistry going to affect things? It's a good answer. It does that, doesn't it? Well, first off, do we need to worry about stereochemistry on this carbon? No. So we could start by drawing the intermediate that we would get after we protonate and have a leaving group. So our first intermediate would look like So we'd start with the protonated oxygen, draw the rest of the ring. And then the second step is a nucleophilic attack, right? Is SN2 on the carbon that has the oxygen attached. And the oxygen leaves, right? So our first intermediate Looks like this. 
it's a little sloppy, but I think you can see what we're, what we're looking at there, right? All the carbons, again, it can be helpful to draw all the pieces of the ring in the same position so that you don't add or lose the carbon anywhere. So then what's the second step? So we're going to protonate the oxygen again. And once again, we have a good leaving group, right? And the second step is the same as it was before. The second step is SN2 by the uh, attack by the iodide, right? Not if it's SN2 and it's already tertiary. So that'd be pretty unlikely. I guess SN2 attack on a tertiary carbon is one of those things we said we don't see. Um, so if it happened this way exactly, if it happened and it was SN2, we would expect it to go through an umbrella flip, right? But if it's a tertiary carbon, we might actually see the SN1 happening more than the SN2, which means leaving group leaves first. In other words, we're gonna wind up making a planar carbocation intermediate, which means we'll get an even mixture of both, um, of both the R and the S conformer here. And so this is pretty much across the board. When stereochemistry is involved, you're gonna to wanna to draw the intermediate or the transition state, depending on the mechanism. Um, because when you work your way through it, like we just did, you notice things you didn't see necessarily if you're going fast, like, oh, that's a tertiary carbon. Um, I can't do an SN2 on a tertiary carbon. Because me looking at this and having all the experience that I do, my first thought was still, oh, it's gonna be an umbrella flip until I thought about it. And I think, did you say something too, Rigney? about the tertiary carbon? Yeah. That's right. And rearrangement made me think, well, this is SN2, not SN1, and which made me think, wait, this can't be SN2. Um, so no rearrangements, but thinking about those kind of details, you know, prompts the other questions sometimes that help you get the exact answer. So then our, we wind up with our intermediate looking like, So it's gonna be planar, right? So and just in the nature of or um, in order to keep it looking the way it was before, um, I'm drawing that planar carbon with the two alkyl groups into the board and out of the board, because as that oxygen leaves, it's just gonna flatten out. And that means our iodide can come in from either side. So our final product here, I don't know why I drew iodide taking up as much space as I did because now I don't have room to draw the molecule that well. Is going to be One, two, three, yeah, three carbons in a methyl group. And this carbon will have both the R and the S. We'll get both stereoisomers. Or you could pick one and draw it and write plus EN. The reason we spend so much time on SN1 and SN2 at the very beginning of learning mechanisms, right? Everything else follows from those two. How are we feeling on these? It's more of the same, just lots of more details, right?
All right, how about for the stereo specific ones? So this was, and with this big description here is our clue. Oh, right, that's gonna be um, our enantioselective epoxidation. So we're gonna make an epoxide, but we're only gonna make one of the stereoisomers. And so in order to tell which stereoisomer we're going to make, we want to we want to rearrange our starting material so that the carbon with the oxygen is you can draw it into the board and to the right, or you can draw it so that we're looking at it from above as well. If it's because it's a lot easier to draw these planar molecules as being flat. So if we just take this and rearrange it, and just rotate it 90 degrees. Plus means up, right? Minus means down. So I didn't redraw it sticking out towards us like this. So up is out of the board towards us. Does it matter with that molecule? Do we get, is that actually going to make a stereo specific? Do we get a stereo isomer? Or is that, I guess a better way of phrasing it, is there a chiral carbon? Is there an asymmetric center there or not? Is there a carbon that's attached to four unique objects? Yeah, that one right in the middle. So yeah, so this is a different molecule than if we drew them the epoxide going into the board. So the, the trick with these is just remember to rearrange the molecule and then plus means up minus means down. So for D, if we do the same thing, And it's a minus. We wind up with the epoxide forming into the board. And once again, it is a stereo, a um, chiral molecule because of that carbon right there in the middle it has four unique things attached to it. It's got the epoxide attached. It's got an isopropyl group attached. It's got a methyl group and it's got a methyl group with an oxygen. Um, it, uh, if you don't rotate the all, if we rotated it the other way, so that the, the um, oxygen was down and to the left or down and to the right, then we can't do pluses up and minuses down. We get the wrong stereoisomer. If you did it, so in theory, if you rotated it 90 degrees and flipped it, it just gets, it gets really tricky to keep track of which version you make unless you're consistent about where you put that oxygen, even though it seems like it's a extra step it's really easy to mix that up it's hard to keep track of okay if i flip it like this now up is down and down is up but then i rotated it 180 degrees so does what does that do to up and down there's a whole field of chemistry dedicated to symmetry symmetry operations in chemistry in inorganic and in physical chemistry are a whole big field um and that that is where i will give credit to Larry Green, that is where linear algebra comes in handy. Because you can represent, if you represent every atom's position um, with a series of vectors in a matrix form, um, you can do all, you can rotate it, you can invert it, you can go find the mirror image of it by doing linear algebra steps to that matrix. Um, 
for instance, if you do a, if you do a dot product, it inverts the symmetry. If you do a dot product times negative one, I think, it inverts the symmetry. Or it's the, the identity matrix, dot product, and something like that. It's been a long time since I've worried about that, and even longer since I took linear algebra. But there are there is a whole field when it comes to these operations. Um, and so for now, it makes the most sense to say, okay, orient it this specific way and plus is up, minus is down. Turns out orbital symmetry is even trickier and more important because you don't need your orbitals. The functions that make up your orbitals don't have to be 90 degrees from each other. They have to be orthogonal to each other. Meaning linear that they the equations that make up your orbitals by definition have to be linearly independent functions, which is really tricky to visualize in three dimensions, especially when how do you have something that's orthogonal, which usually means perpendicular or 90 degrees? How do you have something that's 60 degrees in a three-sided ring structure that's also orthogonal in only three dimensions? Um, math gets really tricky and abstract. All right. So once we make these epoxides, most of the time, the next thing we do is we're going to put them through a ring opening reaction. They're not super stable when they're in that epoxide form because we're forcing these orbitals to be in sort of an equilateral triangle shape, not quite an equilateral triangle because carbon oxygen bonds are not the same length as a carbon carbon bond. Um, so it is more of an isosceles triangle and we can't even officially say that because if you have more things on one side than the other, even sterics can throw that. So all of these triangles wind up being not perfect triangles. The point remains, we have these, these bonds closer than they would like to be to each other. All right, so most ring opening reactions, maybe I can even say all ring opening reactions for these epoxides are gonna have the same mechanism. Um, and it's gonna go through, the only thing that can change is the order of these two steps can change depending on whether it's a base catalyzed reaction or an acid catalyzed reaction. So if it's a base catalyzed reaction, you, then you have lots of a strong nucleophile around, right? That's, if it's a good base, then it's also a good nucleophile nine times out of 10. So if you have a base around, you just have, wind up attacking one of those, um, one of the carbons in the epoxide and the oxygen acts as a leaving group. And then you have a deprotonated alcohol. So step two is just a proton transfer to, to protonate that alkoxy ion we made. Right, and so you, you can see how this works with any nucleophile really, right? Any nucleophile is going to be pretty attracted to these carbons that are part of the epoxide. Carbon oxygen bond is a pretty electronegative bond, a pretty polar bond. Right, so just like once we defined what a leaving group was and what a nucleophile was back last quarter, we didn't really worry about writing out a separate mechanism for every possible SN2 reaction, right? We just said you need a leaving group and you need a nucleophile. Same thing. If it's an epoxide, that's our leaving group. One of those bonds breaks. Uh, and this winds up working better than a regular ether cleavage that's an even better leaving group than normal because of the strain energy. Um, so nor if we had an, if we just had dimethyl ether versus ethyl epoxide or epoxy ethane. So this is epoxy ethane, right? If we just had dimethyl ether instead, our potential energy surface looks like this blue line as I've drawn it with red. This blue line has a very big activation energy, right? 
And so if we want this reaction to happen, we could either make our leaving group a better leaving group by protonating. That's what we do with our acid catalyzed ether cleavage. Or if it's an epoxide, it already is way up here in terms of its starting energy, which means our barrier to get towards the products is a lot lower. which means we actually have a really wide range of nucleophiles we can use, right? Normally we would, we would have to look and say, oh, well, oxygen's a worse leaving group than this, than our nucleophile is a good nucleophile. And so we would say, okay, well, equilibrium favors not making any product. For instance, if we had like ethanol, you know, why doesn't ethanol plus chloride turn into chloroethane. Those are two really common things to have, right? Drinking alcohol and if you put any salt in drinking alcohol, it doesn't start turning into chloroethane. Um, and maybe a very small amount of it does, but equilibrium favors the reactants here because oxygen's a much worse leaving group than chlorine, than the chloride is that doesn't matter nearly as much when you have the strain energy. Right? Because by raising up our starting point in terms of energy, it lowers the activation energy and it favors forming the products um, at, thermo at equilibrium as well. So rather than go through all the possible nucleophiles we can use um, individually, we have these big summary slides. Basically anything where you can identify a negative charge or a, even just a partial negative charge can be used as a nucleophile in a ring opening reaction. So if you use, I don't know why they wrote it like that. Normally we would say N N A O R in, instead of Rona, but yeah, I guess so. They were ahead of their time. But the point remains, you can use this to make an ether and an alcohol out of, so, and we started this from, an, from uh, we made these epoxides starting from an alkene, right? So this gives us a way to, from an alkene, make something that has multiple functional groups. And since we have a wide range of nucleophiles here, including hydrides and including um, Grignard reactions, we can do a lot with this. We can build out these molecules however we like. So remember that for a Grignard reagent, an R group attached to magnesium bromide that turns the carbon into a nucleophile. So that allows us to add carbons as part of the ring opening reaction. And they have lithium aluminum hydride listed. Sodium borohydride is probably plenty strong enough. These ring opening reactions are really, really easy. Um, so you probably would not need the lithium aluminum hydride. Sodium borohydride would, would work just fine. And so it does mean that if we have stereochemistry, we need to pay attention to these steps so that we can make sure we draw the right product. So for instance, if we started with this molecule and we have cyanide acting as our nucleophile, CN, and it can be helpful to remind yourself what the Lewis dot structure looks like for cyanide, so you know what part of it is acting as the nucleophile. So our Lewis dot structure looks like and there's a negative charge on this molecule, so which side of the mole of the of cyanide has the negative charge. If 
Carbon, yeah. So this is another way we can make carbon a good nucleophile is if you use cyanide. We're limited to only adding one carbon and then we add a nitrogen along with it. Um, but we'll find when we get to nitrogen-based reactions next quarter, there are ways we can convert this. Um, this is either known as a cyano group once it's attached or a nitrile. So if you've heard of nitrile gloves, um, nitriles mean that you've got these cyano groups attached to something carbon-based. Right, so if our negative charge is here, that means that our nucleophile, we're gonna attach the carbon to one of the two epoxy carbons. Which side is it going to attack? It's an SN2 reaction, right? SN2 is, is gonna be controlled by sterics, right? So it's gonna to go to the less sterically hindered uh, carbon. Which means that carbon goes through an umbrella flip. The other one doesn't. So let's see. And so it's, again, just a review since we haven't done this in a while. With SN2 reactions that have to go through this stereochemistry inversion, it's usually easiest to keep one of the bonds in one spot and then sort of flip the other two the other way. Really, all of them are moving, but from, from the point of view of drawing this, it's most convenient um, if you if you keep something consistent. And then step two is just gonna be a proton transfer. We have a deprotonated alcohol on there. So if we have a proton source around, like H2O, So our final product here looks like that. And if you want it drawn out a little bit neater with all of the arrows on the, on the page at the same time, um, go to page 577 in the textbook, has it drawn out more neatly with all of the steps shown um, at the same time, as opposed to my draw the arrows, then erase the arrows method. Sometimes that happens. So sometimes you can wind up still making something. Um, it was R before, and it's still R, even though you flip the stereochemistry because your priority changes. So the oxygen, the carbon oxygen bond left, which means that, so before our priority was for the carbon that's on the right, our priority was, one, two, three, four, right? Now our priority is one, two, three, four. 
So what was number two is now number one. So a lot of times our nucleophile and our leaving group are both gonna be priority one, right? Because if you have something with a higher um, atomic number than carbon coming in to replace an, an oxygen as a leaving group, that's your, your two, three, and four priority all stay the same. But if you have a hydrogen as a nucleophile or a carbon as a nucleophile, that's not necessarily the case. And that means, so we still have to draw the stereochemistry inversion, even though it's still R, if it was R before, it's still R. It's still considered an inversion, even though it stayed R, if that, that's the, the tricky part about it. All right, so there's some more practice here. We'll go over some of these um, after break. But I wanted to look at what happens if we do this under acidic conditions first. If we do this under acidic conditions, the order of our two steps changes, right? We have a proton transfer and then SN2. The reason it actually can give us a different product though, because now all of a sudden we make it such a good leaving group um, that we're typically gonna add our nucleophile to the more substituted carbon. Um, assuming it's that because it can go through more of an SN1 type um, mechanism. And so if you look at the reaction summary, let's see. Oh, it's before that. There it is. If you use a strong nucleophile, you get your nucleophile added to the less substituted, the way we were just we just explained it, right? Due to the sterics. However, if you go through an acid catalyzed ring opening because it can go through more of an SN1 type mechanism, because you have such a good leaving group, we wind up making the more stable transition state. Even though it might be more sterically hindered, we wind up adding our nucleophile to the more substituted carbon. It's still considered an SN2 for the purpose of, um, of drawing these. It's Basically, if you remember talking about how transition state character is kind of halfway in between the two, the reactants and the products, it's still considered SN2, but because making that oxygen a good leaving group weakens the, the bonds, it's a really easy to make that oxygen leave. And even if it's a concerted reaction, it allows us to do an SN2 on the more substituted carbon. Um, so it's, it's not like we're saying, okay, it's going SN1, but we're still preserving stereochemistry. It does go SN2, but the rules change a little bit when you make the leaving group such a good leaving group and it's so strained. And I believe that there's a better explanation when you look at the, is it here? So if it's acid catalyzed, is there a good figure?
Yeah, so there's an, a, a description that say that it's the electronic effect. The fact that um, we wind up when we protonate that oxygen, we make it even more strong partial positives on the two epoxide carbons, which means that that the sterics are less important. We've weakened that bond enough, um, especially given that we get that hyperconjugation stabilizing it. When you have extra alkyl groups around that can donate electron density, that makes it even easier to push that oxygen away. Um, so it's still SN2, but really what we wind up with is the, due to the, the strain energy, we wind up with our, our um, intermediate, our protonated intermediate looks more like this than being a true triangle or being a isosceles triangle. Right, so and that's what allows an SN2 attack on a tertiary carbon is the fact that we have all these sterics. One, it's not as crowded as a tertiary carbon would normally be because it's not really tetrahedral, right? Because it's forced to be in this three-sided ring structure. Plus that bond to the tertiary carbon is weaker than to, the, to a primary carbon because of the sterics. Right? And so this, this means we actually have a very convenient way of, of controlling these. If you use, if you do it under basic conditions, you get your nucleophile adding to the less substituted carbon. If you do it under acidic conditions, your nucleophile adds to the more substituted carbon. So it's a really easy way to control Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov. Because it's really, it's kind of like an addition, right? It's technically substitution, but it looks a lot like an addition. And so we can still technically Markovnikov's rule only applies to addition reactions on alkenes, but we can still use that same kind of terminology here. All right. Let's go back to these ones. These were all under basic conditions. Basic conditions means we put our nucleophile on the less substituted carbon. So for A, what's our nucleophile? A benzene ring. We're going to stick a whole benzene on there. So, and it, it's a lot more convenient to write it as pH, but it's worth remembering what a phenyl group is. So that if I ask you something tricky, like what's the formula of your product, you don't lose a carbon because you weren't paying attention. So our benzene ring is going to attach on the more substituted, sorry, on the less substituted carbon. So wind up with the methyl out, hydrogen back, OH up and to the right. And stereochemistry doesn't really matter on that one, right? Because that's two identical hydrogens attached to that carbon that's on the left. Same reactant, only thing that's different for B is the nucleophile, right? So you can draw everything else the same exact place. And you don't have to draw the carbon triple bonded to the nitrogen, but it's a pretty common way to do that. Don't, you know, you don't. You can write it as like that, but it can be handy to remember what that functional group looks like.
What the heck is that? Other than sodium methyl sulfide. Looks like it could also potentially be a, a rapper's name with the capitalization like that. That's a cheap shot at Little Nas X. He deserves better than that. So all that really matters is that you can find a negative charge on it, right? It doesn't matter what it's called. doesn't matter what functional group is even called. You got a sulfur attached to a methyl group. You've got a nucleophile. Right? And so it, again, it's going to go to the less substituted carbon. So So there's really no difference to any of these, right? The trick is just identifying the nucleophile and then remembering acid versus base catalyzed. Where do I put it? Other than that, all ring opening reactions essentially look the same for these epoxides. So this last one, hydride is our nucleophile, right? So we would be adding the hydrogen here, which means we're just making two but two propanol for that one. So that one, the stereochemistry won't even matter. We just made an isopropyl alcohol because by adding the hydrogen, we took this CH two and made it identical to the other methyl group, right? So now all of a sudden we don't have stereochemistry because we have we made it so that we have two identical groups attached to the right hand carbon. All right. So let's draw what it would look like if it's acid catalyzed. Now, all of a sudden, we can't use, it gets a little bit trickier to identify our nucleophile because our nucleophiles are going to be generally going to be neutral if we're doing this acid catalyzed, right? Because we can't have a deprotonated alcohol if we're under acidic conditions. We can't even have hydroxide as a nucleophile. So it has to be something neutral. And remember our first step is just going to be a proton transfer. Worth practicing drawing that so you remember draw the arrows from the electrons towards the hydrogen. And we didn't break any bonds yet. So everything goes back where it was. So now the question comes, what's our nucleophile? And specifically what part of the molecule? Technically, we could use the hydrogen sulfate as a nucleophile, but it's a really bad nucleophile. So what else do we have? 
that's got a lone pair that would be attracted to a partial positive. The oxygen on the ethanol. And it's going to attach to the more substituted carbon. Remember, this bond is weaker than the other bond. So because it's a ring opening reaction, we allow a SN2 on a tertiary carbon here. Then we wind up making So are we done now? What's left, Anna? Yeah, we just got to deprotonate that extra oxygen we just added. So pick a base. Again, it can be, can, you know, whatever is convenient. You can draw out another ethanol acting as the base. Might as well draw the hydrogen sulfate acting as a base since we made hydrogen sulfate in our first proton transfer. And so one last test before we take our break, we just drew a molecule using a whole bunch of ET and ME abbreviations, draw it in skeletal structure. Try and make sure you don't lose any carbons. So for the sake of making this legible, we'll just go to mole view. See, we now have OH up and to the right. We have On this side, we had a methyl is now up and out towards us. Ethyl is now back away from us. Doesn't want to put it at 
angles that play nice because I made those bonds too close together. So it should look something like that. Drawing ethyls with the wedges always looks weird, but it, there's not really a better way to make them look neater, unfortunately. Right, just again as a recap so that we don't forget what ET and ME stand for. All right, questions on epoxides. So chapters like this make it really clear why you need these reaction summaries at the end of every chapter so that when you get a synthesis problem, what you really need to do is, oh, I need to make a molecule with an OH. I better go look at the alcohols chapter and see what reactions I have that put an OH and how I control where it goes. Oh, I'm adding a functional group next to an OH. I should go look at epoxides and see what choices I have for controlling it for one, where do you put each one and how do I, you know, what nucleophiles I can use, right? So it's one of those where you, if uh, I would almost go, if, you, if I had a textbook, um, I would almost go through and put like bookmarker little uh, tabs at the, at every reaction summary um, for the sake of being able to quickly flip back and forth between, okay, which chapter was it that had that reaction? Okay. Um, because it, there's also that good rundown in chapter seven of SN1 versus SN2 and leaving group strength and what are all the possible nucleophiles you could use and how do I control elimination versus substitution was all back in chapter seven and eight too, right? So you don't need to be able to call all of that up off the top of your head. When I ask a synthesis question on a timed closed book exam, it's going to be focused on the reactions that we, there might be some other reactions, but I'm not looking for the fine point details of SN1 versus SN2. I'm mostly looking at how can you use the new tools we just added. But for a synthesis problem on a take home test, you're going to have to be flipping through that textbook. Um, and it's going to take a bit to, to kind of put things in the right order. So it's very, very handy. And if I, given I'm skewed, but even when I was still in grad school, the two textbooks that I still found myself referencing from undergrad um, were my, occasionally my Gen Chem textbook, although by the end of grad school, I had that one pretty much nailed down um, and memorized for the most part, but then my organic textbook, because even working in organic chemistry for research, I still needed to go back and remind myself about other reactive groups that I wasn't used to working with. So mark those textbooks up. You're not selling the chem textbook back, probably in all likelihood. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after and we'll talk about sulfur. It's, I was going to say it, uh, it's, a, it's a fishy, fishy element, but it's not really. Yeah, yeah, nitrogen, nitrogen is fishy. And nitrogen is funny because you can tell by the smell whether it's a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine usually. So primary amines smell fishy. Secondary amines start smelling like meat that's gone bad. And tertiary, you start, actually, no, sorry. Primary smells more like urine. Secondary smells like fish. Tertiary smells like rotting meat. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> it, yeah, like, oh, I, I left for six months and my fridge was unplugged, sort of alarming. <laughs>
Yeah, is that the uh, skunk? skunk? Oh, okay. I hadn't heard that. I'll tell you about that. That sounds that sounds fun. Oh, is that the doing the putrescine? Putres the what the the compound that they add to natural gas to make it to give it odor is a sulfur based. Nice. Extremely potent, unpleasant odor. Freiburg, Freiburg. Unconsciousness, it smelled so bad it knocked people unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very it's a very British way of describing it. All right, let's talk about these. So as you might expect, many things in, um, so when we have sulfur, sulfur behaves mostly the same way as oxygen, except it's a little less electronegative. And so that means our compounds don't have quite as much attractive force. Um, and they're better leaving groups. And they can get more complicated as things are want to do once you give them access to a d orbital. So because there's a d orbital involved, there's a there's a couple other classifications of functional groups that are sulfur based that oxygen can't mimic because oxygen doesn't have that third energy level, doesn't have any d orbital. Um, and naming these though is really easy. Remember when when you were first learning. Um, polyatomic ions, I probably said something along the lines of, if you see thio, it means you took an oxygen and you replaced it with, replaced it with a sulfur. Um, the Greek word for thio or for sulfur was something like thio. Um, so a thiol just means it's an alcohol except with a sulfur instead of an oxygen. And you name them the exact same way, except instead of saying butanol, you say butane thiol. So we don't drop the E um, so that you can still enunciate with that last, that second, I guess that's the third to last syllable. Um, so that you can indicate if there is a double bond or something like that. So we leave that. That E right there. Um, for whatever reason, we just don't do that with alcohols. Although, frankly, it would make more sense. It just doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily. Um, if there's another functional group around, 
then you just use a prefix. And the prefix you use, this is one of those ones where the suffix and the prefix don't really match. Um, you call it mercapto if you're naming a thiol as a prefix. Um, and that actually comes from one of the first, one of the first sulfur-based organic compounds that was ever made. Um, and actually goes back even further than that. Um, the, uh, they were used, sulfur-based compounds were used to treat mercury poisoning. It basically, it could form really, really strong attractive forces to mercury ions that were in solution. And so even before they knew what they were doing, before anybody knew anything about biochemistry, they realized you could treat mercury poisoning with sulfur-based compounds. And so they called them mercaptins um, is another name for, that's another name for a next functional group. We're gonna, look, no, it is thiols. Mercaptins, um, because they form, they basically capture the mercury. Um, so this is one example. Dimercaprol is still used to treat mercury poisoning to some extent. We have better options now, but this is still, you know, a a very useful and cheap compound. And basically, just this shape allows the sulfurs to be and the oxygen lone pairs to basically surround a mercury ion and hold on to it so that it doesn't form attractive bonds with any of the compounds in your cells, with any of the proteins. Um, and then once it's in your bloodstream, your body, your kidneys basically filter it out. And over time, basically you treat, you get heavy metal poisoning over long periods of time of being exposed to heavy metals. They make their way into their blood, into your bloodstream over time and start to accumulate in certain tissues. Um, and you treat it the same way. You basically, you start taking compounds like this where you can make these really strong complexes. Um, EDTA is another one, just stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, um, which basically has a whole bunch of lone pairs that are shaped so that they can surround a metal ion and hold on to it. And then your body just flushes it out through your kidneys, through your urine. Um, but it takes a long time period of time sometimes because it's a it's an equilibrium process right we're just trying to slowly remove the heavy metals from your cells and your tissues by gradually exposing to these it's not a one and done sort of treatment although i think edta i think they if you use things that have a really really strong complex with heavy metals um you can be done in like a week or so of treatment but then you also wind up being malnourished because it also pulls all the good minerals out of your cells and proteins as well. Um, so you then have to go through and you wind up probably anemic during over the course of the process as well. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know that much about the medicinal chemistry other than the general concepts behind this. Um, if we wanna make a thiol, we use a nucleophile with it that has a negative charge and an SH. So hydrosulfide, also, this is also known as um, a sulfide ion. Um, and it basically just acts as an SN2. So if you have a good leaving group, expose it to a sulfide ion, you make a thiol. So if we wanted to make any of these thiols, we would just start by making the compound that has the leaving group in the right spot. And so if there's no, if there's no stereochemistry involved, it's the same molecule, just replace the SH with, a, with bromide or iodide or chloride. And so these sort of questions where it says identify the reagents that you could use, that usually means like one step synthesis. If, I, if it's a more complicated synthesis question, it'll give you a starting place from the, the chemicals in the stock room or starting from these precursors 
how do you get to this final? But so this is a really straightforward, just undo a one-step reaction. If there's stereochemistry involved, you just have to remember that we're gonna have that, it's an SN2 substitution. So you just have to remember that there's an inversion. So for C, we would wanna start with but then still just sodium hydrosulfide. So where these differ from alcohols is that once you make them, they can react a little bit differently. So an oxygen-oxygen single bond was a peroxide bond, right? And we knew those as being very unstable. They're good um, initiators for free radical reactions. Sulfur-sulfur um, single bonds aren't nearly as likely to result in um, free radical reactions for some reason. And likely just that they're, um, even though they're, though they're totally symmetrical, the fact that they, they're bigger and have those d orbitals means that when they break down, they don't break down into free radicals. Um, or if they do, it's free radicals that are much less, um, much less reactive because you've got more shielding between the nucleus in that third energy level. So if we make a, if we start from a thiol, um, this, is, this is a oxidation reaction and it's a reversible oxidation reaction. It's an oxidation because you're taking an SH bond and you're replacing it with an SS bond, right? So the SH bond, the sulfur controls both of those electrons because it's more electronegative than hydrogen. But if you have a sulfur to sulfur bond, that's symmetrical, right? So each sulfur only controls one of those electrons instead of the pair that it had when they were both thiols. Uh, and the net result is just that this is a way of linking things together. And this is the way you see there, there are two compounds in, or two amino acids that have sulfur in them um, that are found in, in human cells. Um, one of them is a thiol. The other one is a thioether that we'll get to in a second. Um, and the, the now correct me if I'm wrong, somebody who's had biochemistry more recently, um, the thiol, is that cysteine? Yes, because the other one's methionine. And that one's the thiol. So cysteine is an amino acid that has basically this as its R group attached to the, the amino acid. And because it can react with other cysteines to form um, these disulfide bonds, it's really handy when you, um, when it comes to quaternary structure in proteins, when you have two different polypeptide chains that you want to stay attached together. Um, a lot of times what you'll see is that they form these disulfide bonds because that means the chances of those two polypeptides separating from each other go down. So you have to break a covalent bond to do it instead of just hydro, um, intermolecular forces. Um, and also it's kind of, it, it winds up seeing, um, you wind up seeing it in places where, where it's advantageous for proteins to sort of wind up folded into sort of a distinct shape, um, the same way that, that a tailor might use clothespins to sort of keep something folded in just the right position. Um, a protein that has multiple 
possible ways of folding itself that are equally stable um, might over time um, you might see two cysteines um, mutate into that structure so that when it gets folded the right way the two cysteines react together to make a disulfide and that keeps it pinned in that direction so that all of a sudden gives it more um, stability than the other possible ways of folding it that without that disulfide were just as likely. Um, it's one of those things that it's really, it's kind of tricky to wrap your head around, but if it started as a random mutation, if you had, let's say you're a cell and you're making these without thinking about it, you're, you have this protein that you're, that you need to make for survival and it's just being, you keep cranking it out, but you're wasting energy on, because only one out of every three that's made actually forms the right way, actually folds the right way. And then over the course of DNA transcription or replication, cell replication, a mutations introduced where all of a sudden there's a cysteine in, at the end of one of those folds. Now, all of a sudden, you might, it might be two out of every three fold properly. And all of a sudden, after a couple generations, every cell is going to have that same mutation because the cells without that mutation waste a lot more energy. So it's not like the cells are thinking about this or planning this or sharing secrets with each other so much as given a chance, anything that has, is, does a better job of using resources to replicate itself will gradually take over the gene pool. And that applies to things that aren't even technically a gene pool as well. It's just easiest to observe it with things that are, that are alive. But the viruses do the same thing. Viruses mutate all the time to become more efficient. And then you wind up with the most common strain of that virus is the one that has this certain mutation. Sulfur is very important. The, um, I believe is it and this is the one, it's methionine is the start codon, I believe, right? AUG is in uh, and the mRNA, when you see AUG in, in the sequence, um, so this would be the five prime end going towards, and then you'd have, you know, a whole bunch of other codons. AUG tells the, the um, ribosomes to start translating there. So that's always gonna be the beginning of your, your protein strand is always the other sulfur containing amino acid. Um, and I think partly that's because it doesn't get used for very much else. It's kind of like a really distinctive, you only see methionine as a start codon. It can show up in other, in other places in the cells, but there's not really an advantage to putting it anywhere else. Um, so it's used because it's distinctive in that case. But yeah, absolutely. There's a reason that sulfur is important in all living cells. And it's because it has those two main properties that oxygen and nitrogen don't have. All right. So these, let me go back a second. So that's a thiol, that's a disulfide. And I'm, I'm missing a slide here showing um, if you have an ether equivalent with a sulfur instead of an oxygen. So a thiol is when you have an, a sulfur instead of an oxygen and an alcohol, right? So alcohol turns into a thiol. Um, an ether turns into, it can be called a few things. Most commonly it's called a sulfide, but that's confusing because that's also the name that we give um, a sulfur with a negative two charge in an ionic compound. Um, so the, the less confusing name, the less ambiguous name is to call it a thioether. Thio means you placed an oxygen with the sulfur. So um, I, our book calls 
calls them sulf sulfides, but makes note, makes note of the fact that um, you can also call them thioethers. Even Wikipedia, good old Wikipedia, uh, if you look up sulfide in Wikipedia, that's sulfide in Wikipedia, but then it has a section on organic chemistry where it says sulfide usually refers to a CSC linkage, although the term thioether is less ambiguous. Um, so it's one of those things where even if you know what you're talking about, you can still confuse yourself if, you're talk if you've got an organic chemist talking to a geologist, say, because sulfides in geology are are always ionic compounds. Like mercury sulfide is, is the mineral known as cinnabar. Um, and that's not a thioether. Right, so this is a better term, but don't be surprised when you see sulfide. Um, you also see that thio show up a lot of places in polyatomic ions. Um, so thiosulfate is sulfate where one of the oxygens is replaced with another sulfur. So it's S2O3, um, but there's also cyanate can, is OCN with a negative charge. And thiocyanate is SCN with a negative charge. All right, so anytime you see thio, that's what you should be thinking. Um, these sulfides or thioethers can also be oxidized in a way that oxygen compounds can't. So a thioether, when it's oxidized, first turns into sulfoxide, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. And this, these can only happen because of that d orbital. Right, because now all of a sudden we have a sulfur with more than um, more than eight electrons. But if we look at the formal charge for the sulfur in all of these, so oxygen makes two bonds because that's how you get a formal charge of zero, right? And that's what's most stable is when you have a formal charge of zero. Sulfur has a formal charge of zero when it's got two covalent bonds because it controls a total of six electrons still, right? Just like oxygen. If you give a sulfur four bonds and a lone pair, it also has a formal charge of zero because it controls all of the electrons that are in the lone pair. So that's two. And then it controls half of the electrons that are in bonds, right? So that's another four. So sulfoxides also have a formal charge of zero on the sulfur in a way that oxygen can't because oxygen second row can never get above eight electrons. And we see the same thing here. Sulfones, now we have six bonds. Six bonds to a sulfur, again, and no lone pairs is going to give us a formal charge of zero. Right, so these wind up being stable compounds, despite the fact um, that they have different numbers of lone pairs and bonds, and despite the fact we get it, we break the octet rule. Right, and so these wind up being used in a variety of places. Um, I believe it was was it just pure sulfur that was dumped into uh, rubber by Goodyear on accident. Um, basically, sulfurs wind up having a lot of really useful properties in terms of polymers. Um, and they, they wind up showing up in a lot of medications as well. Um, I wanna say it was just pure sulfur, but when you, when you oxidize that sulfur at high temperature in the presence of rubber, you get vulcanized rubber, rubber which is either a sulfoxide or a sulfone, I can't remember which. Um, but that, and that's what makes, you know, tires different than, you know, rubber gloves is the addition of that sulfur. And so a lot of it, a lot of our knowledge of how sulfur affects polymers is sort of like guess and check. Like well, what happens when I add sulfur over here? We get something with totally new properties. 
it's not necessarily like they expected it or could predict ahead of time what the new properties were going to be. But that doesn't mean it's less, it's not useful. It just means we're still working on understanding it, which we see with a lot of polymers, frankly. Um, so I just went through Wikipedia and looked at some of the various um, examples of sulfones. Sulfones are, so for polymers, high strength, resistance to oxidation, corrosion, high temperatures, um, and they, they resist creeping under stress. That sentence could be worded better. Um, and basically the uh, capex, if you've done any, uh, any plumbing work, um, is the new, the new school, more expensive way to install plumbing in a house is to use pl this plastic stuff called capex instead of using copper. Traditionally, you can't use PVC for hot water um, and you don't usually wanna use it for even for drinking water for if it's cold water, mostly because it doesn't taste good when it comes out. And, but the hot water will, will warp the PVC and start leaching things out of the PVC over time, which is not good. Um, but these sulfone polymers, um, Capex is, are, they're flexible. Um, like PVC, they're even easier to work with. You don't even need to glue them. You just crimp them. I did some plumbing work with my father-in-law over the summer. So I got to play with some of this stuff. It's really, really cool. If you're building a house by hand yourself, you should absolutely use it, but it's really expensive. And if you're a plumber, you probably don't want to use it unless somebody's paying you a lot of money to use it. Um, but that'll probably change over time because it's really, really handy and really easy to work with. Those crimping tools are expensive, but you only buy them once. Like, they're like 80 bucks. They're not that much, right? I like them. I needed this to repair the video today. Yeah, it's they're they're a pain, but it's way better than having to cut copper and weld copper every time you want to put a new joint in. Um, so it's one of those things that homeowners will spend the money to, to use it a lot of the time, but professional plumbers aren't there yet because they know how to weld copper. It's way cheaper. Um, sulfoxides, sulfones do get used in medicinal chemistry too. Um, sulfoxides and sulfones get used in medicinal chemistry. Um, used to be this dapsone compound is a sulfone that links um, two benzene rings. And that's, you can't quite see it, but there's enough uh, nitrogen on each end of the benzene ring. Um, used to be used for skin, to treat skin conditions. Um, and here's another case of the same abbreviation used in a different field it means very different things. Um, the medicinal chemist, it's odd that even in medicinal chemistry, there's two versions of PCP. Um, there's PCP and then there's pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, and what's the other one I was looking at? Sulfoxides. Sulfoxides wind up showing up in a fair number of places because it gives a sulfur a tetrahedral shape um, with three things attached to it. And so wind up it can mimic a nitrogen to some extent because a nitrogen will be in that same trigonal planar with one, or sorry, trigonal pyramidal with one lone pair geometry. So it'll just be a little bit bigger. So they can do some things where you replace a nitrogen with a sulfoxide um, to, and you can, you can see some interesting things there. And then good old DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide is a really common solvent. In fact, that first reaction here where you start from a sulfide, if you start from dimethyl sulfide or methyl, 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 dimethyl thioether, um, and you put it in the presence of a ozonide, um, you wind up oxidizing the sulfide to dimethyl sulfoxide. And that's, that's the second step in ozonolysis. You just remember, that, you know, add DMS and then you make DMSO which is the same sulfur, just with two oxygens added to it, or sorry, two oxygen bonds, one oxygen. Um, and so we can actually control this pretty easily. This is a case where by, by controlling what oxidizing agent we use, we can control whether we stop at the sulfoxide or make the sulfone. So if we use a weak oxidizing agent and only use one equivalent of it, so sodium periodate is the most common one, we can take a sulfide and turn it into a sulfoxide. But if we take a stronger oxidizing agent and we use two equivalents of it, 
we get the sulfone where we add two oxygens to the sulfur, a total of four new sulfur oxygen bonds. Um, and so it's, I think it's a, it's a little trickier to take a sulfone and reduce it. Sulfur chemistry, sulfur organic chemistry is sort of its, its own field. We don't see sulfur that much in regular organic chemistry. It shows up more in biochemistry and in polymer chemistry. Um, but there is a whole field of study dedicated to, okay, well, how do we take a sulfone and then reduce it back to sulfoxide or all the way to the sulfide? That's not actually as easy as it, as it seems, not as cut and dry as it is to go the oxidation way. And as far as other reactions we might expect from thiols, um, Basically, we can deprotonate a thiol and then make it a, a nucleophile, just like we would with oxygen, right? If you deprotonate an alcohol, we make it, we made a nucleophile we could then use. Um, if we make a, if we deprotonate a sulfide and then expose it to bromine, this is not how your body makes um, these disulfide bonds, but this is how we can do it chemically without the need for all of the, you know, cell mechanisms proteins and whatnot. Um, we can make this sodium bromide or sulfur bromide bond, which then when it's exposed to another deprotonated sulfur, the second sulfur just attacks, attaches here and you kick off the bromide as a Br minus. So first step for both of these is deprotonate both thiols. You gotta do both of them because if we want these to form a, a disulfide link, both of them need to be deprotonated, um, which makes it this really, really easy if we want a symmetric disulfide. It makes it trickier if we want an asymmetric disulfide where one side is different than the other. Um, and then you just expose it to the bromine and you get two um, SN2 reactions in a row. Sulfur is close enough to bromine in terms of electronegativity that these bonds wind up being pretty easy to form and pretty easy to break. And that's all there is for, that's all, there's only like 12 new reactions, right? So, since midterm, we went through alcohols and phenols, and then we expanded that into ethers, epoxides, and thiols. Um, I warned you that this, this quarter was going to be the high volume quarter, right? Now that we have the tools, all of these individually are pretty easy to understand. Just trying to keep them all straight on a test is the trickiest part. Um, and if you look at the reaction summary for both of these two, um, for both of these two processes, or these two chapters, um, it's a pretty good review of what we looked at. Williamson ether synthesis, if we want to make an ether that is not symmetric, um, and then once, and we can make ethers also by using that al alkoxy mercuration demercuration. So instead of using hydration, you remember back to when we first learned about addition reactions if we used water where this green box is we had a hydration reaction right we wind up adding an alcohol if you use an alcohol you wind up making an ether and putting it in the markovnikov position um if we have and then we had cleavage of ethers oxidation of ethers. This happens, actually, we didn't talk about this that much, but if you expose ethers to oxygen, you wind up continuing the oxidation process and you wind up making a hydroperoxide, which is really, really unstable and explosive. So ethers will burn on their own, but what's more dangerous than ethers is the fact that you have old ethers because they make these hydroperoxides, which are both flammable and explosive. Um, and ignite very, very low temperatures. The other thing I was going to point out, this word right there bothers me. 
unsymmetrical ethers. That's actually the correct word though, because asymmetry refers to stereochemistry in R versus S in chiral. So to avoid confusing that, they don't say asymmetric ethers because a symmetric ether can have an asymmetric center. So to avoid that, they just made up their own word that if it bothers me, I'm sure, sure it would bother Julie Ewing even more. Unsymmetrical is a word in chemistry. And it means when you have an ether that's not the same on each side. And to do that, we have to use that Williamson ether synthesis. All right. There's some practice problems there, but I think we'll save these for the quiz and I'll let you out a whole three minutes early. All right, so everybody don't forget the quiz and I will get the recording up, which should actually have audio this time um, as soon as it finishes rendering in a little bit. Yeah. Oh, nice.